Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to be here and uh, my privilege to share with you on the evidence for the resurrection. Of course, uh, first, we should consider, well, did Jesus exist and did he die? Uh, I'll just deal with those very quickly and we could spend more time on any of these things, but there are lots of accounts that Jesus existed, not just from Christian records, but also from non-Christian records. And even a Roman historian called Tastus wrote about how he was executed by the Romans. Now, Romans, when they executed people, they were pretty good at their job making sure the person died. There have been occasionally theories that he might sort of not quite have died and swooned and somehow come back to life. Well, that sort of uh, doesn't work given the competence that Romans had at executing people. And it's not going to make you look like you're victorious and come back to announce uh, new life to the world. So I want to take it as read that Jesus actually died. Uh, we've got four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament that are written from within at least a lifetime, uh, I think a lot less uh, um, time after Jesus, but they're, they're certainly in living memory of Jesus. That is as many biographies as there is of the most famous person alive at the time of Jesus, namely the Roman emperor uh, Tiberius, and also they're on the whole closer than the ones that we have of that Roman emperor uh, in, in time. So it's pretty interesting uh, in terms of just the records we got about Jesus. What well, I want to give you three uh, arguments for believing that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Number one is the empty tomb, that they're uh, the tomb that he was laid in was empty. That's something you get in the four Christian accounts, and it's something that's never uh, debated. And one of the striking, uh, uh, no one uh, debates that with Christians as there's actually, you know, there was a body. In fact, a lot of people think they actually know the very place uh, where it was. I think it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre you can go and see in Jerusalem. They're doing archaeology there. There's a specific place, and the tomb was empty. Now, how do you get the tomb empty? Well, I suppose you can get various ways of getting a tomb empty. I suppose it's possible that some people could have come along and, and taken away the body. Of course, bodies don't have much commercial value like that, and they're slightly heavy. But you might imagine that some devoted followers of Jesus might have been in on some conspiracy to take away his body and make it seem like he'd risen from the dead. But if you are going to hoax a resurrection, the best thing is not to let your leader die in the first place. If you want to present him as the leader of the world and, you know, start a religion the best thing is not to let the guy die in the first place if you are going to have a, res a resurrection of course you don't have very long to plan it and it isn't going to be very coherent and you're certainly not going to be able to get a grand message out of it uh, that enough people a couple of billion people on the planet might find convincing so you can go along with that but I think you can imagine a way of getting the tomb empty but I just think it's less plausible now let's think about a second argument the second argument really is important, and that is the resurrection appearances. Uh, that is that lots of people saw Jesus risen from the dead. We're going to have up on the screen a little passage from a letter written by the Apostle Paul uh, to some Christians in Greece uh, within about 25 years of the events, and he talks about what he had received right early on that they had already received before he wrote his letter. And he said, "'For I received what I passed on to you,' and that was a, quite a while earlier, as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's the Apostle Peter, and then to the Twelve, that's the Twelve close disciples of Jesus. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, that means died, and he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. It's remarkable that you've not just got that letter, you've also got other documents from uh, the New Testament, uh, the writings about Jesus. We're going to have uh, another slide, which actually shows you the sheer variety of resurrection appearances. That um, people see Jesus in the town, in the country, morning, evening, by prior appointment, without prior appointment. Men of, or women, um, uh, different groups see him, uh, individuals see him, up to 500 uh, see him. They see him by prior appointment or not. All sorts of different ways of seeing him, far and close. And in each of these things, there's actually conversation back and forth. So it's not like, oh, it was a... You know, quite flickering light and there in a the distance I thought I saw Jesus over there. It's actually close-up stuff. Sometimes they're even eating together. This is a sort of description we have 
And in order to get those descriptions in the literature so early on, a whole load of people, a shed load of people, need to think that they have seen Jesus. Not just had a vision of Jesus, not just seen uh, Jesus somewhere in the distance or possibly maybe could be, but actually have encountered Jesus. Now this, when you put that together with the empty tomb, it becomes harder to explain. Because you can get rid of the body. You can have, you know, explain why people do that. You might have a few disciples in on some scheme to try and show that Jesus rose from the dead. But that won't explain the large number of people who go around claiming that they've seen uh, Jesus risen from the dead. And if you want to have a large number of people in on the conspiracy, you start running into other problems. Because you, you, early Christians are suffering a lot for their belief. It isn't a a popular thing to be a Christian. It's very difficult. There's no obvious financial gain in it. There's no obvious social gain in it. And there's an awful lot to lose. And what makes a whole load of people go towards that? So you can explain the empty tomb, but when you put it together with the resurrection appearances, it becomes a lot harder to explain. But you know that probably that quotation that there is in one of the Sherlock Holmes books. Well, once you've, once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever's left, however improbable, must be the truth. And people say, but look, we know that resurrections are impossible. They don't happen. People don't rise from the dead. Well, Christians aren't saying that people normally rise from the dead. We're actually saying something pretty exceptional uh, went on uh, then. But also... A lot of people think that when Christians are claiming that Jesus rose from the dead, we're claiming something paranormal, something spooky, a bit like some haunted house or something like that. And we're asking you to suspend your normal belief in science and its operations to believe in something paranormal and spooky. But Christians aren't. And that's where we come on to the third reason. That the resurrection of Jesus isn't breaking a pattern, the breaking the pattern of science, it's making a pattern. That is, that it doesn't happen to just someone random, like someone from Trumpington or North Stowe or Camborne or Central Cambridge or whatever. It's not just some random person. It happens to a particular person about whom we know a whole load of other remarkable things. For instance... Jesus comes from this remarkable people group. If you were to think of all the remarkable people groups there are on the planet, and there are quite a few, the Jews are really particularly remarkable in their history and their national literature, the Old Testament. There isn't as any national literature that's quite like it, and so on. And they're full of inventions and, and all sorts of things, and a um, number of Nobel Prizes won by Jews is, is, is quite remarkable. And all sorts of history, remarkable. He comes from that group. And actually, he died in the capital city of that group, in Jerusalem. And it's not just that he's a random person. He's also a person who was known as a teacher. Just three days ago, I think Elon Musk tweeted about how remarkable it was, this turn-the-other-cheek thing. Well, who came up with that? Jesus. Um, Jesus also came up with the golden uh, rule, the first positive version of the golden rule, to do unto others what you'd have them do to you. You may say, well, how do I know Jesus said that? Let's put it this, it, it, this way. It turns up on his lips, credited to him in that first generation of Christian writings. Uh, also, stories. You think about the, the story of the Good Samaritan. If you don't know it, it's worth looking up. There's a group now called the Samaritans that you uh, ring up if you're in trouble and, and, and contemplating any of your life. Great charity. But how did they get their name? How were they inspired to do that? That it comes from a story that Jesus told. So you have suddenly not just this person of Jesus who comes from a remarkable people group. You have the fact that he comes up with all sorts of amazing teachings uh, about rendering to Caesar uh, what's Caesar's and to God what's God's, ways of dividing up comments on pol um, policy, uh, politics, all sorts of things like that, which are simply amazing, as well as a whole load of stories, whether it's the story of the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son, which have become some of the most memorable in history. But it's not just that. He, as it says in the passage we read, he had chose 12 disciples. Or 12 isn't just a random number. 12 is the number of tribes there were of Israel. 
and he's called Jesus Christ, and Christ is just the Greek equivalent of the word Messiah, meaning anointed one. And why was he called that so early on? Because he was believed to be the promised deliverer for the Jewish people. And almost every scholar who studies it, whatever their viewpoint, believes that that belief was a... um, People already were thinking that of him before he died. By the way, that explains why Romans might want to execute him, okay? So you start thinking it's not just a random person. It's someone who has loads of miracles accredited to him, more miracles than are attributed to any rabbi or any other individual from the time, and they form a pattern. They're not disturbances of reality. They're actually making a message. And then when does he die? When Where does he die? He dies in Jerusalem. When does he die? He dies on the eve of Passover, the greatest celebration that Jews have in their annual calendar when they celebrate when they came out of Egypt. And all these sort of things start coming together. So you start saying it's not that it's breaking a pattern, it's actually making a pattern. And his death and resurrection actually make a pattern of a message. If you open up a Bible, and you can go to the synagogue in um, Cambridge and open up their Bible and go to, right at the beginning, one of the earliest stories of is of a man and a woman taking fruit from a tree, okay, and death coming into the world through that. Now, you, you may sort of dismiss that as a story, but what's so remarkable is that bit is in the Jewish scriptures. Christians didn't write it, okay? But then in the Christian story... Things, the climactic scene in all of the Christian books is this scene of Jesus on a tree, on a cross, dying and bringing life. So that's really remarkable. You have like a story put together that wasn't put together by any one human. We know from a historical perspective it wasn't, that makes sense together. And it makes sense like this. Look, we know we're all going to die. Mike just talked about that. We knew it even if Mike hadn't told us. We know we're going to die. That is our number one problem. And here we have a story of someone who came back from life, someone who gave life and yet also came back from life, came back from death. But also we've got this problem of our our guilt, our sin, the stuff we do wrong. And we think, how can we get rid of this? Well, central to the Christian message and the message that Jesus taught and that makes sense of his death is that he actually died taking the penalty that we deserve so that we can be reconciled to God. So Jesus' life makes a whole load of sense and his resurrection makes a whole load of sense that also fits the pattern of the Jewish scriptures that certainly were written before the time of Jesus. There are various things in his life, whether where he was born in Bethlehem, his royal line, but also even his death and resurrection, which are there hinted at in the Jewish scriptures that you can find in any synagogue. So in other words, we've got these three lines of evidence the empty tomb, and the resurrection appearances. Well, with those two together on their own would make a remarkable whodunit, something really hard to solve. But when you put it together with the fact that it just doesn't happen to any random geezer, it happens to this particular person, Jesus Christ, about whom we can say so many other remarkable things, you start saying, aha, there's a pattern. There's actually a pattern that, according to the story, Jesus is God coming down to earth to show us who he is and dying in our place because of the wrong things we've done. And that's an amazing message as well as one that stacks up historically. Thank you.